it's long been a struggle. Protecting the Amazon and at the same time allowing Brazil's growing population to make a living in this region. Once chiefly populated by remote outposts, people who made a living on the river, nearly 25 million people now call the Amazon Basin home. Brazil is changing. These changes are threatening the environment and its people. The rainforest is shrinking. Brazil's economy has been rapidly growing and is closing in on becoming the fifth largest in the world. But this summer of discontent in Brazil saw hundreds of thousands of people pour into the streets in spontaneous protest, demanding Brazil's leaders improve the quality of life here and pay for better basic services, such as education and health care. Brazil has an ambitious economic growth plan, and to make the economy swell by 4.5 or 5% per year, there are increased demands to further tap into the rainforest for lumber, minerals, farming, and more recently, construction for dams and hydroelectric power. We achieve now new challenges. So we need new fundings to finance that. Eduardo Braga is a powerful Brazilian senator from the state of Amazonas. And those funding must come as fast as possible because if they don't, they are going to pressure again strongly the deforestation in the Amazon. In simple, blunt terms, this rich, diverse region home to half the world's remaining rainforest could thrive. But it also runs the risk of being destroyed. I would say that we are in the tipping point. A tipping point. From Macapá to Manaus, Altamira, and Parapuebas. Only 10% of Brazil's population lives in the Amazon. Demand from Brazil's megacities, like Sao Paulo, is threatening the balance and raises the question, can the Amazon survive economic success? Simmering frustration among Brazilians boiled over in the past several months. Many here are upset that the country is spending multiple billions as Brazil prepares to host the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympics two years after that. But the largest drain on government money has nothing to do with sports or stadiums. This is it. A behemoth of a construction project called the Belamonte Dam in the state of Para in the heart of the Amazon Basin. Proponents say the hydroelectric dam will provide a staggering amount of clean energy leaving a small environmental footprint. Critics charge it is a tremendous threat to the well-being of the forest, the Amazon, and its tributaries. More than 20,000 people will be displaced, and it is one of 60, that's right, 60 dams Brazil wants to build in the next decade to create hydroelectric power. Giant machines chew into hard rock, Construction is overseen by a conglomerate of 18 companies under the name Norte Energia. Não tenho a dúvida que eu acho que a engenharia brasileira é fantástica nisso. Eu não é só engenharia brasileira. Acho que a engenharia é fantástica, porque ela consegue modificar a paisagem, né, e se adaptar ao ambiente. Changing the scenery is an understatement. The Xingu River, one of the main tributaries of the Amazon River was diverted so construction could begin here just two years ago. We were the first crew to get this close to the construction. We're in the belly of the beast. You're looking at what will be the face of the Belamonte Dam. And up there, the massive turbines will go into place that will generate all the electricity. By any standards, this is a massive construction project. To put it in perspective, more earth is being moved here than in the entire construction of the Panama Canal. All this has been done in just the past two years. It will take an additional six years, under the best of conditions, for the Belamonte to be completed. If the engineers are right, Belamonte will create more than 11,000 megawatts of power running at full capacity. 
That's enough electricity for 18 million homes. Brazil's government says it is building scores of dams in the Amazon for hydroelectric power to feed the country's growing demand for energy and is vital for the country's economy to grow at a rapid rate. Otherwise, we're going to have a thermical uh, generation. See, every day we made a, a footprint in the environment. The question is, what's the cost benefit of this footprint? Is this cost important enough to, to justify this footprint? I would say Belo Monte is one of the best cost benefit that we have in hydraulic uh, dam in Brazil. There are many who vehemently argue the environmental costs are just too great. <laughs> <laughs> Maria Oliveira feels only pain. Por ter o direito que eles querem ter fazer uma coisa dessa comigo que sou mulher e idosa. Oliveira says in a heartbeat her house was destroyed by Norte Energia and she was forced to move from the 200 hectares of land she, her children and grandchildren had lived for the past 23 years. Aqui que é, é, é o desprezo, é o desgosto de a gente ter as coisas da gente e o camarada faz uma coisa dessa. Me matado. This land gave her a livelihood, everything she needed, fruit trees, cacao, fresh water, a host of crops she planted, and livestock were right outside her door. Eu não comprava e hoje estou assim, sem nada. Norte Energia has set aside more than 230 million U.S. dollars to help relocate people like Oliveira. And she was moved from her former tranquil setting to this. This is the town of Altamir. From high above, it appears scenic, even quiet. However, a look from the ground paints a totally different picture. Crime and violence have flourished as thousands of migrants and Belamonte construction workers have poured into the city. Eu vivia de um jeito, hoje estou num jeito muito ruim, porque não dá para me viver aqui. Uma zoada, cabaré por todo lado, zoada de carro, morte toda hora. Aí eu fico nervosa, neta aqui. Oliveira's only temporary solace is going through the fruits, seeds, and spices that she was able to bring from her former home back to the squalor of Altamira. Norte Energia did offer her money for her old property. She says about 150,000 US dollars, half of what she says the land is worth. Despite the social concerns, Norte Energia agrees with Brazil's government that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, like Oliveira. O Brasil não cresce se não tiver energia. Então nós temos aí, talvez estudos aí, que até 2030 a gente precisa de energia. Depois disso aí a gente muda a nossa matriz de crescimento. E aí você não, não mais está atrelado à sua energia. And there is the government argument that hydroelectric power is clean energy, no long-term risks. Yes, we do have a cost. Yes, we do have impacted in, in, in that area of Belmonte, but compare with others the impact that we have even in Brazil, even worldwide, the cost benefit is still positive to Belmonte. Philip Fernside is one of the leading scientists focusing on global warming. He's convinced this massive undertaking is bad for Brazil and even worse for the world climate. Dams emit greenhouse gases from the forest that is there when it's originally flooded. It sounds counterintuitive to what Belamonte supporters say. Hydroelectric dams are supposed to be free of spewing carbon associated with fossil fuels. But here is what's at stake. Vast amounts of land will be flooded to build the dams, 
The rising water will submerge thousands and thousands of acres of vegetation. Very quickly loses all of its oxygen. It turns into, into CO2 as things rot on the bottom of the reservoir. And after that, it doesn't have oxygen. So everything that decomposes turns into methane instead. They are greenhouse gases. It's just like opening a bottle of Coca-Cola. You see all those bubbles coming out? That's CO2 that's dissolved in the water because it's under pressure. Leaves and soft vegetation, and that will rot where there's no oxygen. So it produces methane instead of CO2. And methane has a much greater impact per ton than CO2 does. So you have uh, a big release of both gases in the first few years. Here's the problem as Fernside sees it. Belamonte will flood a large area of vegetation. As the vegetation near the surface rots, CO2, or carbon dioxide, will be released. In the deeper water, the decaying vegetation turns to methane, CH4. Fernside says massive amounts of methane will be released into the atmosphere as water is channeled through Belamonte's turbines. This time in the next decade or two is exactly when we have to control global warming. If we, if we don't do something about this now, the consequences are going to be very great. It includes the risk of the Amazon forest itself. Why do people refuse to buy into this? <laughs> I think most people have not even heard about these problems. People have been told so many times that dams are clean energy and green and so forth that they're, they're surprised to learn that they actually emit greenhouse gases. Fernside says there is much developers are concealing about the Belamonte project. It's supposed to cost about 14 billion U.S. dollars. But with all the setbacks and legal challenges the dam is facing, some experts believe it could end up costing Brazil twice as much. And who is funding the project? 80% is being paid for by taxpayers. The same people demonstrating in the streets over allegations of fraud and misuse of public money. It's a project of great investment and poco lucro. Antonia Mello runs Xingu Vivo, or Xingu Alive. For a quarter of a century, she has been battling efforts to build a dam on the river. Mello and many others believe building the dam will lead to genocide for indigenous people who live near the Xingu and depend on the river for food and water. Não tem mais como resgatar. Eles serão dizimados sim. A sua cultura desaparecerá como muitos indígenas nesse país. Damming the Xingu calls for an engineering feat to divert the water into two channels. The Belamonte project will reduce the flow of water through a 100-kilometer stretch known as the Big Bend to just 20% of its current level. Environmental impact statements show it could have a devastating effect on fish here and in turn greatly impact the indigenous population. When you are talking about uh, forests, when you are talking about Indians, uh, when you are talking about water, uh, animals, always we can uh, romantic too much this, this, this matter. Brazil's government and Norte Energia counter blistering concerns by saying only indigenous tribes will suffer no direct impact from the construction. You can talk a lot with the heart and about emotions and uh, everything, but in the end, still we need the energy, the economy, we need new jobs. Indigenous people such as the Kaipo are fighting back against what they see at best as callous statements and at worst, genocide. The dam is going up in the heart of a region that's home to the greatest population of indigenous people in the country. Belo Monte is a project that comes to dizimar these povos here in the Medio Xingu, in the Bacia do Xingu. São os mais assim mais violentados barragem é uma forma de violência muito forte contra as pessoas é destruir a vida que vai nossa luta Xingu Vivo and an army of indigenous people disrupted construction a number of times with demonstrations and legal challenges 
But in the end, man and machine have always returned to chew away at the earth and continue building. When some people look at this, they see environmental devastation. What do you see? If we look at it the moment, we are really doing a devastation. Depois, quando a gente integrar isso aí à natureza, isso aí já não é uma coisa assim que mostra que houve uma devastação. By integrating into nature, Norte Energia and Brazil's government are counting on this dam to provide electricity to as many as 18 million homes and businesses and to help the country's economic growth. Megaron is one of the top leaders of the Kaiapo. while embracing his tribe's long-lasting rituals. As a child, he was among the first of the Kayapo to learn the Portuguese language. But his support for progress only goes so far. Megaron is convinced building Belamonte will have a devastating effect on the Kayapo and other tribes. Os grandes guerreiros que eh, brigaram contra Belamonte desde o início deixou para nós essa luta para continuar essa luta, todos os caiapó vai lutar, vai continuar lutando contra é, barragem Belo Monte. É perigoso, é muito ruim, é ruim o, o que o governo está fazendo com nós indígenas. Nessa parte indígena nós não temos nenhuma área indígena em que o reservatório vai utilizar. Podemos estar usando alguma área de perambulação dele ali, mas não usamos nenhuma área indígena. Eles que estão construindo o Belo Monte é, falam que o, a terra do índio não vai ser inundada, a vida do índio não vai ser modificada, não vai ser interferido. É, isso é mentira. Basically, that entire population would be would be expelled by these dams, and they don't have any skills to survive in cities and so forth. Uh, so that the, the social cost is tremendous. It's uh, it is always touted as just a few people for any particular dam, but the, the sum total of it is tremendous. Kayapo land is off the beaten path. It was a 10-hour teeth-jarring ride down this long and unforgiving muddy road to accompany Megaron to a Kaipo village to see how their world could be affected. This is the way Kaipo have lived for generations, but they have embraced some change. On this day, nurses were on hand to provide vaccinations against a host of diseases. The one air-conditioned building amid the thatched roof huts is a sparsely filled school. Norte Energia offered the Kaipo nine million U.S. dollars to help with the transition once the dam is in place. The Kaipo said no. Não vai trazer de volta para nós o rio, o peixe, a terra, a floresta, animais. Tudo isso vai acabar, vai vai morrer. We spent several days with Megaron and the Kaipo. He quer ajudar nós para nós manter nossa cultura, nossa costume. One of the more interesting people we met is 78-year-old Ben Jai, a local elder and perhaps the most skilled hunter in the tribe. There's no grocery store around the corner. So one long, hot day on the Shingu, Ben Jai took us hunting and fishing to detail what's at stake if the dam is built and the natural flow of this river is disrupted. Eu prefiro mais na minha casa, aqui na floresta. Eu não ando muito na cidade. The hunt is a lot of walking through the forest as quietly as possible, looking for prey. Ben Jai proudly showed off his forest skills and killed a spider monkey. Not only meat for his family, but the Shingu is rich with piranha, a staple in the Kayapo diet. And piranha are attracted to the blood and the monkey meat. 
And yes, we're talking about the notorious fish from the Amazon with razor sharp teeth, as Megaron's bloody heel will attest. In about 30 minutes, using the monkey meat as bait, the group hauled in more than 30 piranha. Why is this lifestyle at risk? Remember, the Belamonte Dam would rechannel a large section of the Shingu, known as the Big Bend. Its flow would be reduced by 80%, so water can be steered through the massive energy producing turbines. The Kaipo will feel the effects. Não tem mais peixe para para pescar porque eles vendiam peixe. É, o rio já está secando e vai secar totalmente e esses povos não vão ter condições de morar mais aí nas suas comunidades. There are two weather seasons here, rainy and dry. Philip Fernside says don't get fooled by a name like rainforest. For months at a time, there is little precipitation along the Xingu, and that will have a huge impact on the Belamonte. The Xingu River is one of the rivers in the Amazon that has the greatest variation in the water level from the dry season to the wet season. There's more than 60 times more water in the, in the six flood zero? season. Six zero. 60 wow. times in the flood seasons compared to the driest time. Então vai ter época do ano que o rio Xingu é um rio de vazão e rio seca, baixa muito. É, pode até, tem cientistas, pesquisadores que dizem que ela pode um, dois ou três meses do ano ficar completamente parada. Remember, Norte Energia boasted fully operational. Belamonte could produce more than 11,000 megawatts of electricity. But scientists say there are times when there won't be enough water to turn even one of Belamonte's 18 turbines. O empreendimento foi idealizado sabendo dessas dessa falta de água em determinados períodos. Então ele foi viabilizado produzindo 4.600 megawatts médios por ano. That's about 40% of capacity. Fernside says if global warming concerns don't move Brazilians, or the risk to thousands of indigenous and other people making a living on the Xingu, the threat that Belamonte could be a complete economic failure should. 80% of it is financed by Brazil's National Bank for Economic and Social Development, so that's basically taxpayers' money. At best, construction will cost 14 billion US dollars, but it could be twice that much in the end. The taxpayers, the government, are taking on all of the risk for these dams. There's nobody insures these dams, so that if, if it doesn't turn out to be uh, uh, to work, uh, the loss is basically taken over by the government. Far downriver, the Kaipo care little about the government's economic investment. No. Desejaria que meu povo vivesse a vida deles, costume deles, do jeito que está, sem nenhuma interferência. É isso que eu, eu desejaria para eles, porque com o contato tem muita interferência. Even without the hydroelectric project, indigenous populations here in the Amazon are losing ground to progress. Megaron laments the fact that many young people here in this community don't want to learn to hunt or fish or traditional Kayapo ways of life. And he says that is a threat to their future. Look around. The young people we saw were more likely to wear hoodies than traditional Kayapo outfits. Most have had a taste of the outside way of life and a better education, a better job. A different, if not easier way of life is attractive. It's a problem sério que nós estamos enfrentando, porque os mais velhos, os guerreiros, lideranças da minha idade, têm essa preocupação com o rio, com a floresta, com a terra, com o limite da nossa terra. Tem essa preocupação enquanto os jovens estão indo para outro 
Um outro caminho. Ele não quer aprender nossa cultura, né? Não quer. E como nós, mais velho, tá ensinando ele para ele aprender nossa cultura, nosso costume e pintura, tudo. Eles têm que continuar essa luta para defender a floresta, defender esse rio bonito, que do jeito que está assim, ó, muito bonito. Não é do jeito que é, o homem branco quer fazer tudo, destruir tudo. There are options. Rather than look to the river for electricity, coal or nuclear power, what about conservation or solar or wind power? There are few voices to trumpet those causes. There's no uh, sort of pressure, there's no economic lobby for any of these other solutions. Uh, Why not? Uh, well, you don't make millions of dollars by doing it, whereas uh, what goes into uh, hydroelectric dams is a, you know, a multi, multi-billion dollar business. But there are business owners who believe that the forest is worth more standing than in a lumber pile. The country has a wealth of natural resources. People and corporations are finding there is a way to make money without destroying the environment. For much of the year in the Amazon, it rains a lot. To the outside world, it may appear as a vast, untamed wilderness. But 25 million people live in the Amazon. That's as many as in North Korea. Most of the population in the Amazon live in cities, like Manaus, which boasts a total population of two and a half million people. In a region where roads and basic services are often lacking, many people here eke out a living. And all too often, it's the forest that suffers. No one deforested because it's stupid or because it's intelligent or because I like the first aid because I'm a serial killer of a tree. No. They do it because they need to survive, to feed the family. There are ways to succeed without leaving a harsh footprint on the environment. Ecotourism is big business, helping Brazil bring in nearly seven billion US dollars in tourist money. It always rains some here, but near Manaus in the state of Amazonas, the heaviest downfall comes from January to April. So much rain, in fact, that a huge swath of forest floods outward some 35 kilometers. Tributaries jump their banks. The air is heavy and humid, and people pay to see nature's wonder. Some people who once made a living poaching animals or illegally harvesting trees are now finding there is money to be made by preserving the forest and its animals. This floating house, about an hour boat ride from Manaus, is a perfect example, and provided our strangest experience in the Amazon. It began with a guide asking if we wanted to see an anaconda, the largest animal in the region. This one here is something like 45 pounds. At least. Yeah. Anacondas in the wild, they, at this time of the year, they can climb up a tree and catch uh, a sloth. They can catch, catch, catch a bigger animal. But normally, what they eat a lot, which is an easy prey, is fish. fish. Aurelia Oliveira lives here with her four children. Her husband is a fisherman, and he caught the anaconda in a net. A hungry giant snake and four children living in a floating house doesn't seem like a very safe equation. This animal can easily be uh, uh, found with 20 to 35 feet Locals talk about lot, seeing a lot of them with over 40 feet. You can really feel it ripple and move yep. and strong. Very solid muscle animal. They can even try to attack a little baby. A lot of babies in floating houses like this in the Amazon, they disappear. Olivera says her family is safe, that the children are used to wild animals living so deep in the forest. As a further enticement to lure tourists, Olivera also has a caiman and a young sloth. Aí nós pegamos uma preguiça e começou a vir particular para cá para casa. Vem muito, vem, vem um rincho, todo mundo vem aqui visitar. People dropping by offer small tips. It's not a lot of money, but it helps feed and clothe the family. The Amazon, first of all, is extremely different. Marco Lima grew up in the Amazon. 
He's an Army veteran and now a marine biologist who spends a great deal of time on the Rio Negro. Amazon is an incredible nest of life. Just outside of Manaus, the dark water of the Rio Negro meets the silty brown water of the Amazon. It is an amazing image. It's interesting because all the books we read said if you get in the water, you can run into all kinds of harmful things. But here we are, and we can dip down like this, and, and, and everything's good. Why are we so safe right now? Well, first of all, this river, as I told you, it's, uh, it's a river that you don't find much mm -hmm. of uh, water life for us, for the Amazon standard. But right here where we're swimming, there are piranhas. But there are simply there are piranhas who don't eat, you know, a flash or we're not attracting them to eat us. At least not yet. At least not yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right, makes sense. Lima brought us here to see the Amazon's river dolphin, or pink dolphin. Another look at eco-tourism. In this small lagoon, tourists can wade in the warm water of the Rio Negro and swim with the pink dolphins. There are strict rules and oversight to protect the animals. This site is run by David Sequeira. Ironically, Sequeira used to consider the dolphins a nuisance. He's a fisherman by trade, and dolphins would destroy his fishing nets, ruining the day's catch. É porque o pessoal vezes vão lançando um cardume de peixe, né? Os botos vão lá espanta. Ou não, quando o pessoal lança o cardume de peixe, que está lá já dentro da rede, os botos vão lá e rasgam a rede, os peixes todos fogem da rede. But now Sakara can make a living by simply introducing people to one of the treasures of the river. It's these little victories that give Lima renewed hope for the future of this delicate environment. Who do you think owns this area? Is it Brazil or is it the, the world? Brazilians were gifted with the Amazon, but the benefits of the Amazon, not only in fish life or plant life, uh, um, weather balance, uh, I think it belongs to the world. But Brazilians were gifted to take care. There are so many riches here, and recently the world has come to appreciate this one. If you haven't tasted acai, you have no doubt heard about it and seen it in stores. It is the trendy drink right now. Before customers can drop five or so U.S. dollars for a bottle of acai, someone has to harvest it. Less than 10% of acai is actually planted in Brazil. Most, like this stand, just grows wild. hundred times a day, 17-year-old Edmilson Silva scurries up acai trees. It's physically demanding, and his family constantly worries. Tem muito medo, principalmente quando chove muito, porque dá mu é muito, muito vento e é arriscado assim raio e mesmo porque ele sobe com faca, estressado. Mas aí é tem que correr risco. It may be a back-breaking way to make a living, but it is sustainable if the branches are picked without damaging the trees. It's long been popular here, accounting for about $250 million in business annually in the state of Amapá. Many growers eagerly take what the forest provides. The Amazon will end everything. The river is everything for us. The water is our survival. The stems produce the berries, and it takes all day to fill just a couple of baskets. Then the product is rushed to port and off to factories. Many locals shake their heads at the knowledge that people in the U.S. will cough up $5 for a single serving of acai. It is impossible to talk about changing attitudes in the Amazon region without talking about the caiman. In the 1980s, poachers killed millions for their valuable skin, almost hunting these members of the crocodile family into extinction. 
Today, its rebirth is one of the big success stories in the Pantanal region of Brazil. This is one in the exact moment. Weber Girardi runs House of Jacare. It's one of 13 government-sanctioned Cayman farms in the Pantanal. It's a way the government feeds the desire for animal skins and meat and helps halt the devastation that comes from poaching. Here I can take everything from this animal. The skin, to make some different products in the meat to sell from any customers. Local farmers bring in thousands of eggs each year that Girardi raises. The number of eggs in each farm site are cataloged carefully. Many environmentalists think the program is barbaric and should be stopped. But Girardi says, consider this, his business acts as a detriment to poaching. And in the wild, only 5% of caiman grow to be adults. Here, 95% do. There are more than 50,000 caiman here at Casa de Jacare. Clearly, they're used to people, but they don't like to be disturbed. These will live to be about two and a half years old, and then they'll be harvested. Each month, they generate about 4,000 caiman skins and about five tons of meat. Most of that is sold in Brazil, but recently, they've also opened up markets in Bolivia, Mexico, and the United States. Many of the skins he sells here or through his website. All the caiman here are local to the area, except one. This is Brazil's black caiman and can grow twice as large as the ones native to the Pantanal. Working with these animals every day, however, does have its risks. This happened when you take her in the arms to take a picture. And stay, like make the position and... How many stitches? Did you take one? 34. <laughs> Today, there are an estimated 10 million caiman in the marshlands of Brazil's Pantanal. And if the skins are going to be sold legally, they must have this government seal that comes on all products from the House of Jacare. From the swamps of the Pantanal to the well-manicured corporate grounds of Brazil's uber-popular cosmetic company, Natura, where the company's vice president for business in Brazil, Guto Pedreira, says Natura's recipe for success is simple. Sustainability is our model of being business. We think about quality, you think about a good shape, but also we think how can you make it less uh, environmental impact. It's not just lip service. It's routinely considered the gold standard for business in Brazil and widely respected in Latin America. Natura is the most popular cosmetic brand in Brazil. We are in some place special. This is the only Natura store in all of Brazil. But don't expect a big rush at the front door. This store is limited to employees only, and they can only buy five products per month. Natura has 1.2 million people, chiefly in Latin America, who basically sell the products door to door. And it works. The company makes more than 4 billion US dollars a year. It's factory squeezing shampoo, skin creams, skin cleansers, and other cosmetics into bottles. Natura prides itself on scientific research determining how fruits and plants that come from the forest can play a role in their products, and that in turn creates jobs. We try to, to with Natura, show other companies that it's possible to maintain this forest. But man, they produce a lot of parts already. Ima Flora is an organization spawned out of the Rio Earth Summit back in 1992 and certifies that companies like Natura are doing what they say operating in an environmentally friendly fashion. I think they want to be part of the solutions of, for a better world for future generations. 
Ima Flores Luis Geddes says customers want to know that companies follow rules, and their studies show consumers flock to companies where the environment comes first. But Geddes says it's not enough for companies like Natura who want to support the environment. He believes government at all levels, federal, state, and local, need to step up. We need a, a bag of tools that can drive business towards sustainability and making Brazil growing a lot as we need, but also protecting natural resources and, and creating value for our society and our workers. And this is the big challenge. We are not in this track yet. There are success stories, but critics charge not nearly enough. Deforestation is still a problem that threatens the Amazon as we know it. Do you see heroes and villains in what's going on here? Well, certainly there are some heroes and villains. So the question remains, what about the future? What's at stake? How delicate is this balancing act in protecting the environment as Brazil struggles to become a global economic power? Living near the water, people at the mouth of the Amazon take what the river gives them. In the city of Macapá, that means waiting for the tide to go down, to embrace the country's national obsession. Prazer de jogar bola na aqui na terra, né, na região aqui no na lama aqui, né? Tradicional do estado. The tradition he speaks of is called Puchelama, or mud football. There aren't a wealth of open, grassy areas in Macapá. So Fuchilama players erect makeshift goalposts, and it's game on. <laughs> Mario Frotas is head of the Fuchilama Federation, a role that keeps him busy on and off the field. Fuchilama, há muitos anos, né? Na verdade, há muito tempo atrás, o Fuchilama ele é desenvolvido como com pelada. Aí já em 2007 foi criada a Federação Amazônica de Fuchilama, que é aí que ficou de fato de direito o Fuchilama existindo mesmo e hoje o Fuchilama é abrange aí aqui o nosso estado quase todo. Even though Brazil is hosting the World Cup, soccer's preeminent tournament, Frotas will watch the games the way most of us will, on TV. The football cray state of Amapá won't be hosting any games. It doesn't have a stadium to handle the crowds. Por que não é, podemos ter aqui uma arena que realmente pudesse agregar, pudesse ter uma estrutura também aqui no nosso estado, mesmo sendo preservado, mesmo sendo preservado com preservação. Hoje nós, nós é, o governo, prefeitura, todo a área aqui política é envolvido nesse processo da preservação aqui no nosso estado. E com certeza, nós gostaríamos muito que, que houvesse jogos aqui. In a move wildly controversial within the nation, Brazil is spending billions of dollars to build a dozen stadiums around the country. Here in Manaus, in the heart of the Amazon basin, Arena Amazonia is going up at a cost of more than $330 million. Building the stadium is considered a big gamble, believing soccer fans will flock to Manaus over such cities as Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. When the World Cup rolls into Brazil in 2014, Manaus and the rainforest will be on display. Construction on this 44,000 seat stadium needs to be finished by December. All of this so Manaus can host four games during the World Cup. Brazil recently stated that during the World Cup, it plans on bringing in $11 billion from soccer fans. But most experts say the government here is fooling itself with such an elevated estimate. $11 billion is 20 times as much money as South Africa generated hosting the last World Cup back in 2010. De certa maneira, o Brasil está reproduzindo o que a África do Sul fez, construindo estádios que se transformarão em elefantes brancos. Juca Cafori has spent his life covering soccer. He believes the World Cup could be a financial disaster for the country. Eu compreendo que um estrangeiro chegue em Manaus e se encante. Mas não sei se você sabe, em Manaus não tem times nem da primeira nem da segunda divisão brasileira de futebol. Os estados vão ficar as moscas. It is this perceived waste of public money, 
more than $23 billion for the World Cup and the Olympics in 2016 that has infuriated people across Brazil. It's not just the country's rank and file who believe the money should be spent on better services. Camilo Capabarebe is the governor of Amapá. Eu diria que nós temos um desafio grande de infraestrutura, aeroportos, portos, estradas, ferrovias, uh, telecomunicações, internet, ainda não é um serviço de qualidade no Brasil de modo geral e na Amazônia em particular. But always in the ongoing race to help Brazil develop in the 21st century and grow economically, the challenge is finding the balance in the Amazon. Loggers are seen by many as the bad guys in the rainforest. Peito do madeireiro, né? Que até então sempre foi como um destruidor. Na verdade, não é, né? Ele é um preservador da floresta. Que o madeireiro interessa tudo para ele. A floresta em pé, não no chão, né? E a floresta estando lá, mais para frente ela vai produzir mais, né? This is poroba wood. It has been over-harvested all over the country and was on the verge of being totally wiped out. Para outros fins, aí ela é feito esse cabo de vassoura, né? Que é um aproveitamento da madeira, né? A gente aproveita o máximo que puder da madeira, quanto menos desperdício, maior o lucro da nossa produtividade. Still, these thin rods come from trees that are over a century old, and they sell for about 25 cents and end up on the business end of a broom. Logging, both legal and illegal, has always been a way to make money in the Amazon. But there are other threats to the rainforest these days. Brazil is big, Brazil is growing very fast. Paulo Oliveira runs a company designed to promote trade. So we are very strong in soybean, in uh, iron ore, and all the minerals by general. We have a uh, uh, land for cattle, we are the biggest producer of everything in terms of the, the commodities. The Amazon is rich in resources, and that's proving to be a double-edged sword for Brazil, opening the door to widespread deforestation. And nowhere is that more evident than in this boomtown city of Parapoebas. Ten years ago, it was a sleepy town of about 25,000. But once the Vale Mining Company opened its massive iron ore mine just outside the city, people came and came. In 10 years, the population has grown tenfold to 250,000. The expansion is evident, visiting the city's one rail station when most people are sleeping. You're looking at a chaotic scene that plays out several times a week here at the train station in the town of Parapuebas. Even though it's in the wee hours of the morning, it's still very hot and humid. These are some 800 migrant workers who have come from all over Brazil to this town looking for work. They're leaving their local small communities because Paro Cuevas is growing exponentially. A lot of these people will find work, but at what cost? All these people are putting more and more pressure on the rainforest. Cada dia passa chega mais gente. E Paro Cuevas é uma cidade acolhedora, né? E tem espaço para muitos. Teve muitos impactos sim. Tem diferença. Na realidade, as coisas a gente vai mudando muitas coisas, tirando uma coisa e botando outra. É, realmente o meio ambiente ele sente sim um pouco de impacto com a mudança da nossa convivência. José Suarez is the director of the Commercial Association of Parapuebas. This is a, a new area of the Parapuebas. And all of here starts only three years ago. Really? Develop all this area. I don't know if if you can find the ideal balance, but we are trying. Trees and grassland are giving way to row after row of homes, and more people means more deforestation. And all city leaders can do is brace for more Brazilians looking for a weekly wage. The people, the government, works with the idea that the population will be the, the double. Double the population in five years. Double in five, seven years. 
from the air, you can see the result of the forest either being swallowed by burgeoning jungle cities or broad sections of land that have been cleared for crops or cattle. Brazil now has more cattle than any country on Earth. Agriculture is a big part of Brazil's GDP. Brazil can grow and harvest and load grain quickly and cheaply, but getting it to port is a different story. Olha, a parte de logística se torna muito cara na nossa região, principalmente devido ao transporte de, 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 da safra. As estradas muito precárias. You won't believe just how bad. Traffic jams can cause entire loads to rot before they reach their destination. Our trucks are waiting two weeks. The soybean in Brazil is, is very competitive and cheap in the world, in the farm. But from the farm to the port, you have the, all the costs that create the problem. After losing hundreds of thousands of acres of the Amazon to slash and burn agriculture, Brazil made huge strides in stopping that practice and preserving the forest. However, the government recently relaxed logging laws, and that led to a huge spike in deforestation in the past year. Yeah, we need more infrastructure, definitely. Brazil is a very large country, but we need to step back uh, instead of just saying we need more roads. We need to think what's the best way of transportation, what's more effective, what's more sustainable, what requires less energy. But on the other side, you have the forces of destruction. They've grown much faster than all these other things. So you have uh, many more highways and dams and things being built. Uh, around the region, and those set in motion processes that, that then affect deforestation for decades in the future. It isn't just a one-time uh, event. Senator Braga says part of the problem is the world looks at the rainforest as a global entity and doesn't concern itself with the 25 million Brazilians there who need food, clothes, and housing. They just care about their problems. They know if the, we cut the forest, they're going to have an impact there. But they don't care how we are not going to the first day. They just want, well, I don't care. I just want that you keep your forest standing. Braga supports an international fund to pay people living in the forest. That money, he says, would keep people from cutting down trees for farming or logging. So should the rest of the world contribute money to protect this? Well, we, we don't ask a contribution, we, we're asking payment because we provide the world with the services. We don't uh, ask in contribution. Brazil don't need contribution. No one needs contributions. We just want to be recognized as services provider. Th that's it. We are providing water to the world. We are providing uh, huge air conditioner to the uh, global warming problem. It's always about the money and the Amazon. The two are intertwined in the eyes of Brazil's leaders. And discussion that somehow the rainforest is a global entity, forget it, critics say. It's very important to remain uh, focused on the problem, that, that is, there's a tendency for people to either be optimistic and think things are improving and they'll take care of themselves and so forth, and then nobody does anything. Nearly nine out of 10 Brazilians live outside the Amazon region. Because of that, many say there is little incentive by Brazil's government to protect that environment or the people that do call it home. So count on Brazil to do whatever it can to spark economic growth. And that means full speed ahead on construction projects like Belamonte. Quanto é criminoso esse projeto? Quanto esse governo, essa empresa estão cometendo crimes contra os direitos humanos, socioambientais e a justiça está calada, sentada em cima apoiando tudo isso. All the while, Brazil's economy continues to sputter growing at just above 2% right now. For Maria Oliveira and the millions of other Brazilians who call the Amazon home, their lives are being uprooted 
by the government push to prosper. Eu não tinha problema de pressão alta e nem tinha depressão. Hoje só vou na rua com as netas porque eu desconheço a rua. Ora eu conheço as pessoas, ora eu não conheço. Aí eu fui consultar com a doutora Rafaela, ela disse que eu estou com depressão, disse que me preocupei muito a falta do lugar que morava, me senti humilhada. A minha mãe, esses seis meses, ela está assim, num processo de muito sofrimento. É, tem dias que eu penso que ela não vai nem amanhã ser viva de tanta tristeza. It's clear people here will have wildly differing lives in the new Brazil. The expanse, the diversity, the raw beauty. Many say it's all at risk. In many ways, it's the unthinkable. But if critics are right, the government plan to breathe life into Brazil's economy is enough to break the back of the environment. And at the end of the day may be the deciding factor that shifts the balance in the tipping point and changes this region forever.